Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this podcast, we hear from doctors Derek Patrick and Billy Knifik about the experience of the war in Dundee. I'm Dr. Derek Patrick, I'm a lecturer in history at St Andrews University. I'm Dr. Billy Kenefick. I'm an honorary senior research fellow at the University of Dundee. We're here to talk about patriotism, recruitment, and also war resistance in the context of Dundee. You have the foundations of what becomes a, a very prominent anti-war movement. But on the flip side, Dundee is also a very patriotic city. There's a really close affiliation between the Home Front and the Western Front in this case, with so many men serving in the local territorial battalion, the Fourth Black Watch. The Independent Labour Party, very, very strong in Dundee. Those guys were activists. The women in the IOP were activists. They went to the factory gates. They had meetings at the corners of the streets. These people were being very, very well known to the same families whose men we're going to sign up and fight. And perhaps it's because of that closeness that the ILP and the anti-war sentiment that they were expressing was tolerated by the Dundee community, even within those that were in the ranks. And I should just add that Ewan Geddes Carr, one of the foremost conscientious objectors, well-known throughout the country, his brother was a socialist. They grew up as socialists. Their father was a socialist. His brother joined the forces because he felt once the war was declared, it was his duty to fight that war. And there doesn't seem to be any long-term animosity between the two men. News from the front travels back to Dundee fairly quickly, largely down to the fact that they have a number of what become known as fighter writers. We're talking about men here who are an employee of DC Thompson, the local publishers, who go off to war with the 4th Black Watch, the local territorial battalion, and contribute reports, send back poetry, and any number of odds and ends to the local press. Dundee is very well served with local newspapers, the Courier, the Advertiser, the Sunday Post, the Evening Telegraph. Despite the fact that these people are supporting the war, their poetry never ever goes against the anti-war faction at all in Dundee. Even somebody like Edmund Scrounger, a Scottish prohibitionist party leader, who was against the war on pacifist reasons, for religious reasons, these men still had a great deal of respect for him, despite the fact that he would not support the war. And his newspaper, the Scottish Prohibitionist, actually supported the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. The fourth flight watch from Dundee is quite unusual. It's a territorial battalion which comes from a single city. If you look at who served, it really represents every part of Dundee society, mm -hmm. from officer class, the commanding officer, Harry Walker, who is a partner in the Caldrum Duke Works. Now, under his command, he has men who work in the Caldrum Duke Works, You've got men from the Caledon shipyards. You've got men from the agricultural hinterland to an extent. And the officer class tend to be local chartered accountants, solicitors, etc. It's almost as if you've taken Dundee society and recreated it in miniature. In microcosm. There was a lot of people signed up for the Fort Black Watch from Lockheed as well. Their antecedents are largely Irish, both Protestant and Catholic, but Irish nonetheless. When we talk about recruitment in, in the early stages of the war, when you can choose which regiment you want to go to, an interesting thing with Lockheed and the Irish connection is the fact that you find men joining Irish regiments, Connaught Rangers, the Munster Fusiliers and so on. These are first, second generation Irishmen, men of Irish birth. In terms of diasporas, Dundee's experience of the war really mirrors Scotland. And you do have large numbers of Dundonians, large numbers of Scots turning up in Canadian regiments. Battalions like the 16th Canadians who are Canadian Scottish. You find them in the South African forces, the 4th South African Infantry, South African Scottish. We have one Dundonian quite far travelled who turns up in the Russian army, a chap called Eric Peyton Smith, who has an import-export business in Kiev and finds himself in the Tsar's army with the Kiev Hussars. Yeah, I think he's linked with Dundee. It's pretty, it's pretty tenuous, tenuous, yes. You know, I think he could speak better Russian than he can broad Dundonian. <laughs> that would be for sure. Don't forget we also had quite a lot of Scots in Argentine, mm -hmm. for example. A lot of those people were serious businessmen. You know, it was about 60% commissioned officers out of several thousand people who come back to Scotland and signed up with the local battalions and companies that uh, there had been associated with their families for three and four generations, so much so that Spanish speakers who didn't speak much English came back to Scotland to end up non-commissioned officers in Scottish battalions. The reasons that so many Scots left before the war, partly that's because of the lack of opportunity as they saw it at home. 
So they go abroad for the hope of getting a better life, be that Canada, mostly America, but also Australia. England gets a big number of Scots going south on a regular basis, but as a percentage not as high as overseas immigration. I think the same reasons that people will leave the country is one of the reasons that you get recruitment into the army. I don't think it's any accident there's a link between economic downturn and unemployment and then increases in recruitment into the army. You get three square meals a day. You take pressure off a working class family income, which is already under pressure. When you look at the reasons why people enlist in 1914, the economy plays a big part in that. Certainly you find in Dundee itself, Linton Andrews is one of the fighter writers. When he talks about going to enlist in Dundee, he talks about being pushed to the back of the queue by men who are unemployed. You're an educated man, you've got a job, you can wait your turn. You have the image of Bruce that appears in the Dundee Press, 1314 to 1914. So why was 1314 significant as a date, Billy? It's important because that was... Battle of Bannockburn, basically the birth of Scotland as an independent nation. In the foreground, you've got uh, this image of Bruce looking on as all these Scottish manhood surged towards Britannia in the background. There's men of all persuasions. There's felt hats in there, top hats in there, fedoras, flat caps, no caps. You wonder if Scotland wasn't actually in a war footing in 1914 because they were already preparing for these Bannockburn commemorations. I think it must have been argued, certainly, that the children in Scotland, at least, in preparing for the Bannockburn celebrations are mobilised, and that mobilisation to help the war effort isn't too much of a jump to go from 1314 to the needs and requirements of 1914. An example of that would be the amount of young boys who weren't military age, who actually went and joined the colours, lying about their age. We find a good number, certainly in the territorials in Dundee, who are 16, 17, who spend a year at the front before they're actually sent back. The exact number is difficult to ascertain because men lie about their age. You don't just find that at the lower end of that scale. You'll come across men in Dundee, men across Scotland, men across Britain, who claim to be in their 30s, when the reality is these men are in their 40s or 50s. One chap in Dundee jumps out was a man called Arthur White, who was a dock worker. And Arthur White claimed to be 32. Arthur White was 44 if he was a day. But he joined the Ninth Black Watch and tragically he lost his life at the Battle of Lewes. Lewes was such a big thing in Dundee for Scotland period. It kicked off on the 25th of September 1915. Why was that so important to Dundee and to Scotland generally? It was important to both. To take Scotland in the first instance, it's the first time really since I think Culloden that so many Scots have been on the same battlefield. And on this occasion, we're all on the same side. 30,000-ish Scots are on the battlefield that day. There's representatives of the regular army, the territorials and Kitchener's new armies as well. So you have both the 9th and 15th Scottish divisions represented who are all volunteers. The 4th Black Watch served the City of Dundee Battalion. They had gone to war in February 1915, around 800 strong. They'd received various drafts of new recruits, but by September 1915, they're down to 400, 500. The battalion go into action, that part of a diversionary attack to draw the Germans' attention away from the main battlefield, and they suffer appalling casualties. They're quite successful. They capture two lines of German trenches, but under increasing pressure through the day, they're forced to give ground, and it's then that the casualties start to mount. The Colonel Harry Walker is fatally wounded. Elmsley Tosh, the second in command, is killed, and the impact on the officers in the other ranks is appalling. Is that why Dundee talk about Lewes as being Dundee's Flodden? I think so. Dundee's Flodden, Scotland's Somme, it's been referred to as both. In recent years, we've come to appreciate the sacrifice at the Somme at Passchendaele. But for many years after the end of the First World War, Lewes was the date that stuck in the minds of many Scots. Dundee was the first city in Scotland to have a commemorative event for the Battle of Lewes in October 1915. And after the war, it becomes fairly standard in many Scottish cities and towns to hold a commemorative event on the 25th or close to the 25th in Perth, in Edinburgh, in Kirkcaldy. In recent years, we've become more focused on the sacrifice at the Somme or at Passchendaele. But for many years after the end of the Great War, Lewes, the 25th of September 1915, was the date that really stuck in the memory of Scots. And in Dundee, when the War Memorial was erected, the beacon was always lit, certainly up to 1940, to commemorate the Battle of Lewes. It went into abeyance during the Second World War, but it has come back. It really shows the sacrifice that Dundee made that day. And it's one of only two cities or towns, the other one being Hoyk, that I know of, that commemorates a specific day 
in the Great War. Hoyt commemorates the 12th of July 1915, which was their local battalion's attack, Kings of Scottish Borders' attack in the Dardanelles. I should just add an example of a man who was hounded into the armed forces because of the white feather wielding women. Mm. Early 1915, we believe, the local newspaper started a campaign to get as many women who had loved ones in the armed forces out. They were going to give each of them bags of white feathers and their job was to go up the main street into the city centre and hand them out to as many men as possible. The man was actually 54, mm. but he just had a young looking complexion, he had dark hair. He went into the army and within four months had lost his life. Mm. At the end of the day in Dundee, 63% of all men who could be in were recruited into armed forces. To have 63% of men of military age serving by the end of the war is far greater than you encounter in a number of other cities. And that's also reflected in the casualty rates. The casualty rates in Dundee are twice that of Glasgow. And Glasgow is often held up to be an example of a city that really suffers heavily as a consequence of the war. That feeds into the growing sense of war weariness, Mm -hmm. that sense of inequality of sacrifice. This is bearing heavily on the shoulders of the working class, much more so than it is for the middle classes. And that's why from 1916 onwards, the left-wing parties, generally speaking, that's across the country as a whole, not just Scotland and Dundee, people are listening to the message more. And it's going to have its ramifications. Perhaps for that reason, uh, discharged soldiers and sailors, even as early as 1917, although initially against the so-called pro-German independent Labour Party for their anti-war views, start to support them. A by-election in 1917 between Edmund Scrimger and Churchill, the 40-strong discharged soldiers and sailors support Scrimger Mm -hmm. against Churchill. In 1922, the women are out to get him. They've got the vote partially. They were against Churchill because he did not support the suffragettes. He sent the army into Ireland, which didn't help. The Black and Tans had a terrible reputation in Ireland. So, of course, they turned the Irish against them in Dundee, who were very much for them in 1908. The Labour Party and the Liberal Party were already against them as well. So Churchill, as they say in Scotland, his jacket was in a sugarly nail. His position was precarious, to say the least. They brought in Scrimger and E.D. Morrow of the Union of Democratic Control. And between the two of them, they topped the poll in Churchill was sent home to think again, a wee bit like Bannockburn from 1314. (laughs) (laughs) That's a fair wee discussion we've had there. Where does it leave us? We've concentrated in this project, Great War Dundee. Micro history, case study, call it what you will. But because Dundee is a small enough city, we can make some sense of the big things that were happening, the role of women, politics, anti-war politics, the impact of large casualties and the loss that meant to the city. And we haven't even got near yet the post-war period, which is going to be a really bad time for Scotland and it's going to be a terrible time for Dundee. I think you're right. Dundee is a fantastic micro-study. I think your research in some respects has maybe raised more questions than it's answered. I think the only thing we can agree on, Derek, is that there's still much more research to be done. Absolutely. So, nose to the grindstone. Back to work. (laughs) Doctors Derek Patrick and Billy Knifik on the experience of the war in Dundee. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Chris Williams about the experience of the war in Wales.